Welcome to our talk. I'm Praveen and I will be presenting our work on using survival models to estimate long-term engagement in online experiments. This is a joint work with my wonderful colleagues at Spotify. The talk is split into three short segments. First, I'll provide a motivation for long-term engagement metrics. Then we'll see how one can estimate long-term engagement metrics. And more importantly, we'll see how to validate such metrics. Finally, we provide a case study using historical experiments at Spotify. Let's look at why long-term engagement. Primary motivation for our work comes from rising importance of subscription services. Many companies are moving towards subscription model. Here we show an example from a recent work by Jeremy Yang and all. They show that the shift towards subscription services in NYT's business model is pretty evident. This is not entirely new. For instance, streaming services such as Netflix and Spotify have long relied on this model. With the shift towards subscription services, the need to ensure users are satisfied by the service provided to them is paramount. Generally speaking, subscription model is a leaky bucket business model, and there is a need to retain users on the platform. In this work, we're interested in measuring how product changes can impact long-term engagement. That is, how to run A-B tests with the goal of measuring and improving long-term engagement, such as retention. A common practice today is to run A-B tests where we compute aggregated metrics, such as total consumption, which are often short-term. They're computed from the start of an exposure to the end of the experiment and we compute treatment effects on these to make decisions. However, this approach of using short-term metrics can often be myopic and could misrepresent users' long-term needs or goals. For instance, this can lead to a recommender to promote clickbaity content. Therefore, there's a real need to accurately and efficiently measure long-term outcomes. Another metric one can use in these scenarios is retention rate. That is, we measure the proportion of active users at the end of n weeks, often referred to as WAU or weekly active users at week end. A major drawback of such long-term retention metric is that we need to decide on what n should be, and we need to run A-B tests long enough to be able to measure these quantities. Typically, retention metrics work under the assumption that satisfied users return and stay engaged. Another way to view this is how long does it take for the user to become inactive? That is, we track users' engagement levels every week, count the number of weeks it takes until the user becomes completely inactive for a certain amount of time, say a week. That is, how long does it take for a user to become not a weekly active user? Of course, it could take a really long time for users to become inactive. So we want to be able to estimate the metric without having to wait for long periods. Our goal in this work is to estimate time to inactive metric quickly using short-term surrogates. In the rest of the talk, we'll see how to estimate such a metric and more importantly, how to validate them. Okay, now how do we estimate time to event metric? Estimating time to inactive is a classic time to e event modeling problem. Here, it is challenging to use traditional ML models because some users might continue to be active for long periods of time. And we often want to make inference before the event has happened. In the figure above, each row represents a user and the dots indicate that the user has become inactive. You can see that the blue users are still inactive at the time when we want to make the inference, as denoted by the dotted line. One might be tempted to ignore those users, by, but that would lead to censoring bias in our estimation. That is, it would severely underestimate the true time to event metric. Therefore, we turn to survival modeling for these type of problems. Survival modeling is a natural framework to study time-to-event problems as it accounts for censoring bias. In this work, we will use the Cox proportional hazards model. The hazards ratio denoted by the letter H 
asked here is simply the ratio that compares the rate at which an event happens. That is, the rate at which users become inactive in our case. And the Cox model is a semi-parametric mo survival model that allows the hazard rate to change over time. But it assumes that the hazard between groups, say treatment and control group, is constant over time. This, is, this model is well studied in the medical domain as well as in churn modeling. Our focus in this work is more so on how to validate such model metrics. Typically, a good metric must be directionally aligned and sensitive. Directionality has been well studied in the literature in the context of metrics. In our case, it is to ensure that the predicted time to inactive metric aligns with the observed metric. However, it takes a really long time to observe whether the user becomes inactive. So we compare against week four active usage metric. A good metric must not only be directionally aligned, but must also be sensitive. Sensitive metrics are those that can detect significant effects when present. It typically depends on two properties. One is the probability that there is a treatment effect, and other is given that there is a treatment effect, what is the probability that it will detect it? The example figure at the bottom illustrates two, these two properties. One on the left, you can see that metric A is more sensitive than B because it can find more differences that are statistically significant for the same set of experiments. On the right, you can see that when there is a significant effect, metric C detects a larger effect than D. Back to what makes a good metric. Since our proposed metric is a model metric, that is, the metric is a prediction coming from a survival model, in addition to sensitivity and directionality, we must also check certain assumptions before using the metric and also ensure that the model accuracy passes certain thresholds. Survival model accuracy can be measured using common metrics proposed in the literature. These include AUC, concordant index, and Breyer score. We skip the details in the interest of time. Let's look at what are the assumption that needs to be satisfied to use the time to event metric one by one. The first two are the positivity and ignorability assumption. The positivity assumption states that the user must have a non-zero probability of being assigned to treatments. And the ignorability assumption states that unobserved confounders does not contain information about the treatment W and outcome Y that is not already contained in X. Both these assumptions are satisfied when using A-B tests. Next is the surrogacy assumption. This specifies the condition under which an effect on the surrogate function is unbiased. Recall that we're using a set of proxy metrics or surrogates S to predict retention outcome Y, given a product change or treatment W. The causal chain is shown in the figure on the left. The surrogacy assumption is satisfied in all the in if all the information between treatment and outcome flows through the surrogates and it is violated if information flows directly from treatment to outcome. In other words, all the effect on outcome Y must be mediated through surrogates S. Aetis and all extended a previous work to show that this assumption holds even when more than one surrogate is used. That is in our case, even when more than one metric is used. We rely on this theory in this work to show that the proposed metric is valid. To check that the assumption holds, we introduce a simple trinity check. The idea behind this check is that if your surrogate contains all the information that the treatment contains about the outcome, then when you train your model with only the surrogates, it should perform just as well compared to another model that's trained with surrogates and the treatment. We use the log likelihood ratio test to check if adding the treatment gives additional information to predict the outcome or not. If it does not, then the check passes. Final assumption is around the data used for training of the survival model and metric inference. The assumption requires that 
The characteristics of the experimental corpus on which inference is made must be similar to the observational corpus. What this means is that observational corpus is used to train the survival model and it must be similar to the corpus of the A-B test. A simple way to check this assumption is to use out-of-time evaluation such as AUC. Next, in the final segment, we will see how we applied the time to inactive metric on a corpus of experiments from Spotify data. We start by describing our experimental setup first. We built a corpus of experiments that were run on Spotify's experimentation platform during 2020. We sampled experiments run by personalization team with the goal of improving uh, satisfaction. And we restricted the set of experiments that ran for at least five weeks. Uh, the first week is used for the exposure window and the rest of the four weeks uh, was used to compute the observed metrics. The survival model itself was trained using behavioral data collected prior to the experiment. And to compute the time to event metric, only the first two weeks of data, uh, the, that is the 14 days as uh, indicated by the red box, was fed into the model along with user demographics to get the metric. As mentioned earlier, we use Cox proportional hazards model as the survival model. Now that we've described our experimental setup, we'll see how our metric performed in terms of the criteria we outlined earlier. First, we look at the predicted time to event metric against observed week two and week four weekly active usage. This plot shows that there's generally high alignment between the predicted and the observed metrics. You can see that there's very high correlation between our predicted time to event and the observed week two as well as week four uh, weekly active retention. We also compared the predicted time to event metric against other engagement signals and also computed confidence interval. We observed that the predicted uh, metric has high correlation and this gives us confidence in terms of the directionality of the metric. It is also interesting to note that the directional alignment is comparable to week two com consumption. Uh, we'll see that things get interesting as we get into sensitivity of the metric. Again, this helps us gain trust in the predicted metric and checking that there is directional alignment is helpful here. Now that we've established directional alignment, let's look at the sensitivity of the metric. The baseline here is week two retention. We compare the predicted time to inactive with week two retention, which is denoted by the dash li dashed lines. And also the observed week four retention, which is denoted by the dashed lines with tiny dots. As you can see, the expected survival at the very top uh, which is the time to event metric, has the highest sensitivity in terms of both discriminative power and statistical power. The survival probabilities at the top uh, is also coming from the time to event metric and is the probability at each week. And that's why you see a curved line there. Now we check the surrogacy assumption using the log likelihood ratio test. From the re reported p-value, uh, we see that the test was not significant. Therefore, we can safely conclude that there is no significant direct information that flows between treatment W and outcome Y, and therefore we can conclude that the surrogacy check passes. Finally, we look at the model performance in terms of the survival model accuracy metrics. We see that the AUC scores are pretty high for the first five weeks. Even at week 20, uh, the AUC score is about 0.8, which is considered to be pretty high for this task. And to complement this, the concordance index and prior score metrics are also pretty high. Note that we report both out of time and out of sample evaluations. Out of sample results are where we test on users who are not in the training sample. And for out of time results, we show performance during a time period that's different from the training period. You can see that the model performance is quite similar for both. We do this as a sanity check to ensure that the comparability assumption is satisfied, and clearly here it is. In conclusion, 
we show that simple survival models such as Cox proportional hazards can be used to estimate long-term engagement. The metric is directionally aligned to observed metrics, it's more sensitive, and it passes surrogacy checks. Most importantly, it's more efficient. That is, experimenters need not wait for several weeks to make decisions based on long-term engagement. Yes, thank you, uh, Pravin, for the talk. So, um, do we have any quick questions here? Uh, yeah, Pravin, so I uh, just one quick question, like um, what are the, you know, downstream tasks are you are you applying this kind of a study to? And what are some like uh, uh, future uh, directions you, you, uh, you think that worth exploring? Yeah, so downstream task is basically like uh, for making experimental decisions. Um, so if we want to uh, make decisions based on say week four retention or week six retention, we don't want to run the test for six weeks. It's just too long. And um, so we want to free up uh, uh, tra uh, traffic for other experiments. So we want to just run two weeks. I see. Uh, in terms of, yeah. So that's kind of like the main, main goal. Um, and in terms of sort of future work, um, I think it's still like we want to uh, try using it in practice uh, more. And uh, the, the corpus we used was basically from uh, a, one of the personalization teams, as I mentioned. Um, I think it's kind of hard to generalize one model to all the experiments that runs in a company. So uh, we want to test out like how easy it would be to generalize this. Uh, across. Yes. Okay, yeah, thanks, Pravin.